All right. And everyone can see that? The PowerPoint? Yes, you can see okay. it. Great. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Matilda, for um, having me here. Uh, my name is Shayla Sanovich, and on behalf of Drivers of Food Choice, I am delighted to be here this morning to join the discussion on food environments and talk about our findings on perspectives about food safety in diverse low- and middle-income countries. Rapid food system transitions occurring in low- and middle-income countries are beginning to shift how food is produced, processed, and distributed. With these emerging shifts, we are witnessing growing concerns over the prevalence of unsafe foods in markets and how consumption of these foods increases rates of morbidity and mortality among vulnerable populations. This convergence brought us to think about how food choices are being made in these contexts. And so when considering the importance of food safety perspectives, it's important to recognize that it isn't just about considering the biological and chemical perspectives about what is used to grow and process foods that might be harmful but also paying attention to how food choices are influenced by people's perspectives about the food in their environment. And so with that in mind, our aim was to identify and categorize people's perspectives about food safety in five diverse low and middle income countries to build our understanding of what helped shape individuals' perspectives about food safety across various settings. And today I will summarize our findings on people's perspectives about food safety across five countries from the Drivers of Food Choice portfolio. And these include Guinea, Ghana, Kenya, India, and Vietnam. These five projects provided transcripts from 17 focus group discussions and 303 interviews. We conducted a thematic qualitative analysis using a combined deductive and inductive approach. And from that nine a priori themes were identified through previous research and five emergent themes were derived from transcript data. And from our analysis, we learned that individuals construct their interpretation about food safety through two domains, narratives from their personal experiences and narratives from social influences. These narratives individuals constructed through their personal experiences are rooted in their ideologies, everyday practices and ways of thinking. Whereas those constructed through social influences are shaped by their culture, religion, rituals, and social traditions. And narratives constructed from these two domains sculpt individuals' understanding of food safety, including related practices, processes, and consequences. Three main sources of information contributed to individuals' knowledge about food safety, and these were healthcare, media, and social networks. These sources provided individuals with information on safe food practices, food adulteration, and health consequences associated with consuming unsafe foods. When addressing concerns about food safety, individuals cited vendors as a source that threatened safe distribution of food. This mistrust in food vendors stemmed from concerns of vendors adulterating food or participating in unsafe selling practices. One individual illustrated these concerns as they recounted their experience, stating, one time there was a woman who was telling us that the milk has not expired, but if you look closely, you find that there are two expiry stickers on the package. So even when it has expired, they remove the first sticker so that it seems as if it has not yet expired. Individuals also indicated a mistrust in the methods used for food production and processing, such as this individual who observed diseases emerging from poor livestock handling practices. And concerns about food safety were also linked to foods encountering contaminants from pesticide or sewage runoff. One individual mirrored these concerns, stating those planted along sewer lines, like these ones planted in greenhouses, the number of poison is higher there, and that is what gives us cancer. When asking what assures individuals that they can trust the safety of foods, our analysis revealed several themes, including transparency of home-cooked meals, where individuals felt food prepared at home was safer on account of the hygiene practices applied. As one individual recalled, someone cooking outside, I do not know the kind of hygiene she has. Maybe she has not washed her hands, but she has been cutting onions with her dirty hands. I will be affected at the end of the day. But when I'm cooking at home, I will wash my hands, I will wash the veg vegetables, I will get the hygiene. Environmental sanitation and food hygiene practices 
both of which ind influenced individuals to believe food was safe, provided they were practiced. For example, one person stated cleanliness, things like milk, like a clean environment. You also check if that person is clean and also the container she is using. When you come and boil the milk, it will not go bad because it is clean. A positive vendor relationship and reputation, cleanliness in the vendor's appearance and vendor's agency led individuals to believe the safety of their food was validated given vendors use risk mitigation strategies throughout the food production chain. To illustrate one person expressed, so me as a leader, it is my responsibility to ensure that all rules are followed and meat leaves here when it's safe, clean and good, the way it is required. Mine is to ensure all that. And similarly, individuals considered food to be safe if they were certain that safety protocols were followed throughout the food supply chain. For example, one individual said, milk has a lot of people who handle it, from the one who milks to the different brokers. You never know what happens during the process of transferring the milk. You find that maybe they add things or even put the milk in dirty containers. They have no regard for hygiene. You see, the packet milk is only handled once, so it's less contaminated. And lastly, individuals were influenced to believe food was safe on account of the local food system's ability to enforce and enhance quality control, conduct thorough food inspections, ensure vendors adhere to the safety, food safety rules. The following individual re reflected these beliefs, saying rules are strict due to government oversight or the veterinaries from the government make sure whatever products come from there is very safe. And so biological and chemical attributes of food are not the only drivers of food choice. Rather, individuals construct narratives to shape their meanings about food safety, acquire knowledge about food safety from various sources, cite concerns about consuming unsafe foods, and identify conditions that help assure trust in the safety of their food. And collectively, these conditions and characteristics that influence perspectives about food safety in turn drive food choice. Policies intended to improve food choice must acknowledge and engage in the individual's experiences, knowledge, concerns, preferences, and attitudes around food safety. Assessments of food safety policies in these countries will provide evidence about whether individuals' perspectives about food safety are considered. And so the findings presented today indicate how individuals' perspectives about food safety influence their food choice. The success of food safety policies hinges on consideration of these perspectives. And lastly, we would like to thank our funders, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the entire DFC family of grantees, technical advisors, and collaborators. Thank you. Thank you, Sejla, for your presentation on food safety. So last but not the least, we have um, a presentation by Anthony Muchai Moniara. Is Anthony here? Yes, I'm here. Yes, please go ahead when you are ready. Okay. So my name is Anthony Moniara. I'm a PhD student at the University of Glasgow and also I'm affiliated with the Technical University of Kenya. So I'll be presenting on the barriers and facilitators of healthy eating in a low and a middle income community in Nairobi, which is a qualitative study. So my PhD work revolves around uh, type two diabetes prevention, which is on the rise in Sub-Saharan Africa. And my work is mixed methods. So I've done a case control, I've done um, scoping review and a qualitative uh, case study. And I'll be presenting the results of this qualitative case study. So diabetes is preventable through target of modifiable risk factors, um, the main ones being weight, diet, and physical activity. And in Kenya, the consumption of healthy diets is quite low. About 6% achieve the recommended um, intake of fruits and vegetables, according to the STEP survey. So we aimed to investigate the barriers, uh, the facilitators of consuming healthy diets in Nairobi, which is the capital uh, city of Kenya. So we did a qualitative case study in Nairobi. Uh, we picked two communities. Uh, one is Bukburu, which is a middle-income community, which is the photo on the top. And the other one is Mokuru, which is a low-income uh, community, which is the photo at the bottom. 
we recruited about 15 participants and the first interviews we did them face to face and then due to covid restrictions we did telephone interviews for the rest the interviews were transcribed translated and thematically analyzed so we mapped our barriers and facilitators on this behavior change wheel which is a framework that helps to classify um, sources of behavior so at the hub the green um a, a circle there um, on that big circle so it has the sources of behavior which uh, is capability motivation and opportunity and then uh, surrounding uh, the sources of behavior is where you can intervene so you have the red uh, circle which shows the intervention functions and the gray circle is the policy functions that you can use to intervene so we mapped our findings and our themes around uh, the sources of behavior and then I will be discussing some of the intervention uh, and policy functions that we can use to intervene. So the first um, finding or first theme was on capability and capability is mainly on knowledge and skills at the individual level. So most of the participants perceived a healthy diet to be a balanced diet, uh, which um, may not always be the case. Um, so a diet with carbohydrates, proteins and vitamins Few participants, mainly from the middle income uh, community, mentioned healthy diets being having low sugar and uh, fat and having adequate fruit and veg, but none of them from both communities knew the recommended servings of fruit and veg. So one of the participants from the low income community says, no, I don't know, referring to the recommended servings of fruit and vegetables. I only buy kills for 30 shillings or even those traditional vegetables for, the, uh, for 30 shillings just that I don't know what portion I'm supposed to eat. The next uh, source of behavior is motivation and motivation is um, concerned with the perceived uh, beliefs, perceived consequences, um, things to do with uh, habit formation. And so one of uh, the motivators of consuming a healthy diet was the perceived benefits of healthy diet, so such as having good health. So that motivated some people to consume healthy diet. Secondly, uh, the belief about consequences. So knowing the harmful effects of unhealthy diets and especially seeing the consequences of unhealthy diets in the community. So seeing people struggling with diabetes motivated people to eat healthy diets. Then um, another motivator, which was a barrier, uh, which is under the motivation uh, source of behavior was the need to make food more tasty with added sugar, fats and oils. So leading to people eating uh, unhealthy diets and people did mention that um, increased consumption of uh, sugar, for example, led to a decreased sweet uh, sensitivity. So as someone says on this quote, they are uh, referring to the people who like sugar normally say that their mouth has gone bad. That is why they like a lot of sugar. Then uh, the third source of behavior is opportunity and opportunity is concerned with societal influences, but also the environmental context. And here we had, um, this was the major barrier and facilitator of consuming healthy diets. So the first of them uh, of uh, the societal influences was an influence of upbringing. And so people mentioned that introduction of healthy foods in childhood, uh, transition to adulthood or the, uh, or the introduction of unhealthy foods in childhood transitioned to adulthood. So a social worker from the middle income uh, community narrates about his experience as a child and I'll not read the whole quote. Uh, so he says what he's doing now, he's taking a lot of starch, a lot of proteins, a lot of carbohydrates. And he thinks that is all because of how I was brought up. We were never brought up being cautious about making sure that anytime you take a meal, it has to be a balanced meal. The other um, source of behavior was social norms, and this is association of unhealthy diets with a high socioeconomic status and association of traditional diets, which may be more healthy with a low socioeconomic status. So a consultant from the middle income community says, instead of taking uh, maybe arrow roots or sweet potatoes, you see people eating banana cake or eating Weetabix with sugar, or granola with flavored yogurt. So such foods are associated with a higher socioeconomic status than traditional foods. So that may have led to people uh, taking more 
um, westernized diet or um, unhealthy diets and taking less of the traditional foods which more likely uh, uh, have lower levels of added sugar and oils and, and fats and oils. The other uh, major theme on um, the opportunity as a source of behavior was affordability. And this was uh, a major difference between the middle income community and the um, low income community. So um, woman from the low income community mentions about vegetables being expensive. So she says you'll have to spend about 100 shillings for you to feed on traditional uh, vegetables with two children. Now that was not the case in the middle income uh, community. Um, affordability of healthy foods was not um, a concern as the social worker mentioned that um, the perception is always that people to think that you have to have a balanced diet, it is expensive. He says this is, this is not the real, uh, this, it is not in the real sense because you can have ugali and you can have omena. And he continues to mention about 100 shillings or 200 shillings, you have a balanced diet. So 100 shillings in the middle income community is not much, but it's a lot uh, in the low income community. Then the other um, a source of behavior is um, access to unhealthy diets at the opportunity level. And this was mainly in the middle income community. So there is um, increase in uh, westernized uh, big food industries, such as the Kentucky Fried Chicken, and they are cheap uh, and so it's affordable. So they, it's, it's available and it's affordable. So this uh, man from the middle income community mentions about uh, a package uh, going for about two pounds or three pounds and, they, and therefore it's affordable. And so that increases the intake of uh, unhealthy diets. Then the other concern um, or a source, uh, a barrier in the opportunity level or safety concerns of um, healthy food such as vegetables. And this was, uh, for example, the human resource officer says, I have doubts about vegetables because in most cases we are not sure where they come from. Yeah, there's this perception that especially kale and spinach have been planted in, in most cases we believe they come from sewages. So these may have deterred people from taking uh, healthy foods such as uh, fruits and vegetables. So going back to the behavior change wheel, um, and from those sources of behavior, we can intervene at various um, policy and intervention functions. We can educate um, and communicate um, about healthy diets uh, using mass media, using health education sessions, so that people can know the composition of healthy diet, that a balanced diet is not always a healthy diet. Um, communicate about the savings of fruit and veg that are needed. We can persuade people about the benefits and the consequences of healthy diets. Uh, we can model healthy diets from childhood since upbringing was a major theme that um, uh, influenced the diets that were taken in adulthood. And we can have fiscal measures that increase affordability of healthy foods, mainly in the low income communities. And we can have food safety regulation to make sure that the healthy foods that are in the market are safe and therefore do not, um, does not affect um, the optimism of people taking or eating those healthy foods. So I would like to thank the study participants, the com uh, community mobilizers, my supervisors, and the transcriber who transcribed the interviews. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Anthony, for your presentation. And I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to all the presenters for their insightful presentations and also for keeping to time. So we do have a good amount of time for questions. I'll first like to go to the chats and then we can um, answer some of the questions from the chat. So we'll go through the questions in the chat. And after that, if there are any follow-up questions, um, you can unmute yourself and then ask them. Please raise up your hands first if you need to um, ask a question when we do that. Okay, so the first question is for Magnus, is from Wanja Kinutia. I hope I said your name right. And it's asking how sure were you that the fresh foods um, that you talked about were free from pesticides, aflatoxins, and other microbes harmful to man? 
Yes, <laughs> I can hear the question and, and the answer is, is that we are not sure uh, about that. Uh, we are fully aware that food safety issues is, is also related to, to fresh vegetables and fruits sold uh, by, by microcellars. In our study, uh, there has been one part where we have taken samples <coughs> Uh, just to see and, and learn about food safety for different food groups. Uh, it is quite uh, complicated uh, bringing samples from Ethiopia to labs in Sweden. We are still stuck in the, in the process of, of, of um, moving, the, moving the, the, the samples. So, so there will probably be results, we hope so, when these um, bureaucratic, bureaucratic issues are solved. But, uh, yeah, that's the answer. Thank you. So the next question is from Ayala. Um, and there's a question for you, Magnus. It says the local food environment seems to be defined as a certain radius, like a five minutes walk from a given location. Do you know how much of a typical household's food is procured from five minutes from their home? In other words, the actual food environment for the household or do households usually travel further? Uh, well, the, the, the food environment uh, is composed of both the, the external food environment, which is certainly bigger than only the neighborhood food environment. That would be entire Addis. And people do move and people go to work and they buy food outside their neighborhood. So the question is very relevant. Uh, but we have measured this, and we do know that for most food groups, and on average, roughly half of what is consumed is bought within a five-minute walk. So the, it, this is also a way to, to show that the very local proximity food environment is quite important for, for consumption. Okay. So Ayala's question also, um, she wanted to also find out do you think that this will be different? The five minute walk will be different for wealthier households? Um, yeah, it is, it is uh, difficult to, to say. We, we haven't looked into that. Uh, and, and what we can say is that for those neighborhoods with fewer uh, very poor households, uh, we, still, we still see roughly the same um, share um, uh, sourcing the food from the local, very local neighborhood. So, so um, it, it is not, it, it's not an easy answer. We, we also know from our colleagues that uh, even those having better, are being better off and being able to afford different food groups, they do source uh, many, many food groups from, from the neighborhood and from from microcellars and, and, and so on. So I, I, I'm not able to, we, I don't think we are able. I have colleagues here in, in, in the uh, seminar, our, our uh, EI, uh, Eva Poirot Ekstrom, who presented last week, and also Chris Turner. If they, if they can help, please help me. But that, that's my answer <laughs> from what I know. I, I can add to that. I think it was an interesting thing, which we certainly can. Uh, uh, analyze whether uh, whether the food environments in relation to different uh, social stratified households, if the food environments do differ. And I have just jotted down that this is an analysis which we would move on and, and have a look at. Uh, but otherwise, our, it is interesting to see how a kind of equal uh, socioeconomic uh, stratification was in terms of availability in the different um, um, neighborhood uh, uh, food environments as we had. We have another presentation and in, in the parallel session by Semira uh, Abdelman Menan and, and if you search her name I think you will find a very very interesting paper in relation to what matters in terms of consumption perception of availability or perception of affordability. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your input there. So um, there is one last question for you, Magnus. Um, it says, could you explain how you measured and calculated neighborhood wealth? 
Yes, I can. Um, we use the household data uh, from the more than 5,400 households. And for each household, we calculate an, uh, um, an index of wealth based on several variables uh, related to assets and so on. Uh, and then we divide the, uh, the, the population, the sample into quintiles. So we have those, uh, those quintiles being the ones with the lowest wealth. Uh, and when we then assess or when we stratify the, the um, neighborhoods, uh, we, we um, are interested in the share of the um, households in our sample living in that neighborhood, the share of those belonging to the poorest quintile. Uh, and if that share is is high, then they are then are, are characterized as a as a, uh, the the uh, least wealthy. And we have set limits here, so below twelve and a half percent of uh, the households being characterized as or belonging to the the poorest quintile. Well, then the 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 the, the neighborhood is is the um, belong to the most wealthy. And if, if more than 25% of, of the household belong to the poorest quintile, then uh, it is the, uh, then the, we call it a neighborhood of the lowest wealth. And then we have in between there the middle. So in this way, we are able to compare uh, neighborhoods. Uh, and, uh, that's very important. Thank you. Um, any follow-up questions relating to Magnus' presentation? We could take it now and then move on to Michael's presentation. No? Okay. So the next question I have here is for Michael. Um, and it's from Ayala Weinman. It's asking, is there any indication of a U-shaped pattern where healthier foods rather than UPFs are reviewed as status symbols at the very high end of the income spectrum? Michael? Hello? Yes. Yes, 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 there was, the, there was an indication of that. So in terms of the perception, um, objectives we, we analyzed, most of the students had a view that um, rich people always bought food in right proportion, meaning they had a balanced diet food. So every food they bought, there was a right proportion of protein, carbohydrates, and other, other food items on it, as well as bought foods to add up to meet the, to meet the dietary behavior outline, um, outlined by the the sustainable development as an attention Okay, the other question is um, to ask about your methodology. Please, can you describe the best friend pair interview and why you will use that over other interview techniques? Okay, thank you for that question. With the, we use the focus group discussion and the best best friend pair interview. So since we were strangers to these students on campus and they needed to be safe on campus and not to talk to any stranger. So we thought of we making it, um, we having the focus group on one side and best friend. So the person will walk into the interview room with his friend, his or a friend along. So that the person would feel comfortable, feel safe and be willing to talk to us. That's why we, we use the best friend pair in addition to the focus group discussion. Okay, thank you for your responses. I would like to open it up to anyone who has any other question for our presenters. Please unmute yourself and speak up. Hello. Hello. Yeah. yeah hello. Good, afternoon. Okay. Good, af good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Wajaki Nodia. I just wanted to, to comment that uh, the choice of where to buy food, especially at lunch hour, is simply because uh, it is a social setting 
and you have only one hour to look for food. So if you go to a formal restaurant, then you find that you won't be able to have enough time to, to ask for your food and eat and be able to socialize. So um, I know you had specific study questions, but I think also there is need to look a little bit further, but I'm very happy with your work. Yeah, uh, it shows us a lot of information that uh, most people do, do not take into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Wanja. Any other questions for our presenters, please? We do have a little bit of time, but we can take more questions. Okay, so I had a question for Michael. My question, um, my question really is about um, you. You presented that they were avoiding places with long queues, and that because of the numbers of people there, they weren't choosing that as a place of convenience. Can you explain that a bit more? I don't know if I got what you were saying about that. That. For convenience, um, students were avoiding places with too many people. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so students were basically, um, because they are dealing with time and they don't want to spend much time at the, at the market, that is the night market or bushki. Most of the times when you go to bushki at, during the day, during the lunch time, you see some of the food vendors have a very long queue. So because to avoid time, wasted of time at the at the lunch, uh, wasted of time for the lunch time, they would rather prefer going to a place where there is no queue so they could eat faster and catch up for their next lecture. So that's why they avoided the the long queue places. And was the reason for um, people preferring such places because of the prices, or what do you think? Because you would think that usually the issue of price might, um, the influence of price might be stronger than that of, you know, per se time or other issues. Yeah, price too was a factor because um, for longer play, um, longer areas with the uh, vendors with area long, uh, area, uh, food vendors with longer queues, um, people had a perception that the food is good though, but the queue is too long for them to waste time or over there. So they would rather go to a place where they could eat the food like that because that's what their money could afford. So they could just buy it like that, eat and catch up for their next lecture. I hope okay. I, I that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Ayala, can you ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I had a question for Anthony. Uh, you indicated that some people don't really have an, an awareness of the importance of balanced diets. So I wondered whether there's nutrition or health education in schools and whether in the curriculum, is there any effort to facilitate knowledge transfer to the students' households? Yes, so um, I indicated that most of them, when we asked them uh, what is a healthy diet composed of, so they did mention that a healthy diet is a balanced diet, which could be true to some extent, but not always, because you could still have a balanced diet, which is unhealthy, if you don't have the portions of uh, the food that are needed. So for example, they didn't know that you needed to have um, five servings of fruit and veg. So you could have a balanced diet, you have the vegetables, but one portion or two portions. So the education that is there in the schools of um, eating a balanced diet should be complemented to the composition of a healthy diet as per WHO um, recommendations and guidelines. Okay. I hope Thank I you, answered, Anthony. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. Ayala, do you have a follow-up for him? Uh, no, that's all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So my other question is for Anthony as well. So you did mention that um, when it came to environmental sustainability, um, a larger proportion of your respondents did not know what it was. 
can you share with me or share with us how how the others who understood environmental sustainability explained it? What was people's perception of what environmental sustainability is? Um, I can't recall which part of the presentation is that. Um, so the environment is, as per the model I used was the opportunity. So either the societal inferences or um, the physical environment. So I didn't quite get the question. Okay, so there's a slide where you show that um, when you asked about environmental sustainability, a number of them did not know what environmental sustainability was. Uh, no, no, I didn't ask about environmental sustainability. So what I asked oh. was about um, the composition of healthy diets and none of them knew uh, for example, sorry, the recommended sorry, Anthony, this question is actually for Michael. I'm sorry about okay. that. It's for Michael. It's Michael mentioned environmental. Is Michael here? Hello? Yes. Yes, sorry for, I have some one to attention. Sorry. Um, with, the, with regards to the sustainable, um, environmental sustainability. Yeah, there was a slide on that that most of them didn't know about it or they mis misunderstood it for um, environmental um, sanitation. So what others who said they knew the environmental sustainability was just an interaction, the interaction with the environment in a way that would not destroy the resources that we have of, in the environment. So that's what most of them, those who understood it, interpreted it to be like. Okay, thank you so much. Are there any other burning questions? Because we still have a few uh, more minutes. Any other questions for our presenters? If I may come in uh, again, Wanja Kenodia, I just wanted to concur with what Michael is, is saying because the word environmental sustainability, uh, especially in, in, in Africa and also in Kenya, people look at it as the environment in terms of uh, trees, plants, uh, the ecosystem, and how to make sure it's healthy. But when it comes, relates to food, that's a word that is never, um, has been, even I myself have not heard of it. So it's, a, it's actually um, a good thing that you're bringing it, the, this issue up. Because if you visit a lot of the markets in Kenya, you find that even though the vegetables and fruits may come uh, uh, well packaged uh, from the upcountry market from the farms, it's actually uh, poured on the ground. And the ground sometimes, you know, is, you know, <laughs> it's not very clean actually, because sometimes there's a, in the city, the sewage system may be, may have, may have flowed over the, the, the previous night and so it's dry. So surely um, the food contamination may not necessarily be at farm level, but may be at the market level. So even by the time somebody buys and washes it and uh, puts it in their vendor uh, shop, it may, not, it may actually have been contaminated because even the water they use for washing may not actually be very, be very clean. So they, that is why I was very keen to know what are the, you know, the contaminants that may be there in the food. Okay. So thank you so much, Wanja, for your contribution to that. Um, I would like to open it up if any of the presenters has any last minute um, comments that they would like to give before we wrap, we wrap up. Hello? Okay, so, yeah, hello, hello go ahead. Yeah, yes. I, just want to, I just want to thank you for the opportunity given to us to present our abstract to you to you all and your participants. We are very grateful for the opportunity and we look forward to having more conferences like this to share more of our work. And thanks for their feedback as well. We are also grateful for you sharing your research with us. So um, if there's no other comment, I would like to wrap this up by saying that um, we are very grateful to all the presenters today to uh, Magnus, Sejla, Michael, and Anthony for sharing their research with us today on perceptions, attitudes, behaviors, and influences, and also availability 
when we talk about the general um, food environment discussion. Thank you for taking the time and I hope um, it was a fruitful uh, deliberation. Thank you so much. So I'm going to leave the room and we're going to join the main session.